everyone. Welcome to Unconfirmed, the podcast that reveals how the marquee names in crypto are reacting to the week's top headlines and gets the inside scoop on what they see on the horizon. I'm your host, Laura Shin. You may have heard, I'm doing a survey. We want to know, how do you think we can make the show better? How would you like to see Unchained and Unconfirmed expand? If you could just take a moment and go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019, that's surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019, your answers will be a huge help to me and my team here at Unchained and Unconfirmed. Also, those who answer the survey can enter to win one of five free Casa Bitcoin Lightning Notes, plus a free year of Casa's Gold membership, including a multi-sig security app for iPhone and Android, a Trezor hardware wallet, a Casa Faraday bag, and 24-7 support. Those of you interested in learning more about Casa or about protecting your Bitcoin investment generally should check out my interview with CEO Jeremy Welch. Thank you to Casa for donating. CypherTrace cutting-edge cryptocurrency intelligence powers anti-money laundering, blockchain analytics, and threat intel. Leading exchanges, virtual currency businesses, banks, and regulators themselves use CypherTrace to comply with regulation and to monitor compliance. Today's guest is Ben Mesrick, author of the book Bitcoin Billionaires. Welcome, Ben. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Tell us what your book is about and how you came to write it. Sure. Bitcoin Billionaires is the true story of the Winklevoss twins and their rise in Bitcoin. It begins with the settlement they received from Mark Zuckerberg. So it starts where the social network ended, and then it goes all the way to Bitcoin 10,000, or the first time Bitcoin reached 10,000. So it's really the story of their journey through this new revolution, um, having already been part of one other revolution. And when you reference the social network, you are also the author of the book that that movie was based on. So what, how did you, if you, you know, since you previously wrote that book, how did you then decide to sort of do this quasi sequel? Right. Well, you know, when I wrote Accidental Billionaires, which became the movie The Social Network, the Winklevoss twins were the bad guys in that story. You know, they were the alpha males. They were the jocks. They were the cool kids on campus who claimed that Mark Zuckerberg had stolen the idea from of Facebook from them. And when I wrote that book, you know, they were kind of one note characters. I didn't really, you know, get to know them that deeply. And about a year and a half ago, I read in the New York Times that the Winklevoss twins were the first real Bitcoin billionaires. And this kind of blew my mind. I didn't really know what Bitcoin was. People had been pitching me stories about Bitcoin for years, but I had kind of avoided it. And just seeing that the twins were suddenly back in this new story, um, it really intrigued me because you don't usually see second acts like that. And, uh, and I got to know them again and realized I had gotten them wrong in the first telling. And so I think the social network was unfair to them. And I think I'm kind of readdressing that with Bitcoin billionaires. And what exactly did you get wrong? Well, you know, those guys, when they walk into a room, you know, there's like something out of Greek mythology. You meet them for the first time and they remind you of every 80s movie you've ever seen. Uh, they're the guys I hid from in high school. You know, I was in a locker <laughs> hiding from guys who looked like Tyler and Cameron. And I judged them, you know, and when I wrote Accent of Billionaires, um, there, there was something really respectable about them. You know, they were men of honor. They believed in right and wrong. They believed that Mark Zuckerberg was screwing them over. And that was that drove them. So all of that, I think, was correct. But I also painted them, I think, as just, you know, one sided. Um, so I, I think that's where I got them wrong. The reality is, I mean, these guys are very smart. They speak multiple languages. They're Latin scholars. And how they dove into Bitcoin and sort of the new economy of, of cryptocurrency, it sheds an entirely new light on, on who they are. And then you go back to look at them and Zuckerberg and you start to wonder, well, what, what was really going on there? I mean, were they really these guys that didn't know what they were doing and Zuckerberg then built Facebook? Or did they have some interesting ideas that Mark ended up taking from them? And there was some information, I believe, that you didn't have access to when you wrote Accidental Billionaires, which came out later. Can you talk about that a little bit and how that also changed your view? Yeah, absolutely. So these instant messages that were on Mark Zuckerberg's computer at college, they didn't come out till after the Winklevoss twins ended up getting their settlement and, and pretty much after we did the social network. And these instant messages are are pretty damning. You know, they're, they're Mark Zuckerberg strategizing about how to screw over the Winklevoss twins. There's some quotes in there that are about how, you know, he, he calls all of us 
dumb Fs. I don't know what you can say, right, you know, on this. Yeah, but uh, No, yeah. let's not do that. <laughs> right, right. But he basically, you know, talks about how people are foolish to give them all their information, uh, how he feels like it's okay to be unethical as long as you don't do something illegal. All of these quotes make him look really bad. But they also frame his battle with the Winklevoss twins differently because he admits in these instant messages to, to stringing them along with their idea and then launching Facebook at the last minute so they can't do anything about it. And so this shows this strategy to, to, to destroy them. Um, so I think this is very new information. He also, it turns out, had hacked into their website. They had created something called the HarvardConnection.com, which was later renamed Connect You. And he made a fake profile of Cameron Winklevoss, you know, with all of this kind of racist, sexist, horrible stuff in it and put it online. Now, if you were to do that today in the environment of today, I mean, Zuckerberg would never have recovered from that. So this was something that didn't come out when we did the social network. And, and I think it colors him very badly. So let's pan out a little bit, because obviously to write the two books, you had to research both social media or Internet 2.0. And then obviously now for the new book, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies pretty extensively. So what's your assessment of the two types of technology and which are you more excited by? Well, I will say they're both revolutionary. I think when Facebook first happened, it was this revolution in the social order. It changed how we all live. It made the whole world go online in a way that we hadn't before, and it changed everything. And now I feel like Bitcoin is the same thing. I only choose stories where I think there's going to be some massive world change because of it. And Bitcoin is one of these things. And, you know, I came to this uh, as someone who didn't know anything about it, who my parents' generation called it a scam, and, and I believed it was a bubble or a scam. But as I looked into it and as I sort of dove into this story, I came to believe that this is really a, a revolution in money, but it's also a way of freeing ourselves from, from all of these sort of, you know, shackles of an old world banking system of borders. You know, it, it's something, if done correctly, can really be peer-to-peer, -peer, really doesn't need someone in between it. And I thought that was a really cool sort of concept. And so I do see in Bitcoin some of the same things I saw in Facebook. And which I'm more excited by now is definitely Bitcoin, because Facebook has taken a real turn. Um, it's become this monster, which I believe it was already, always intended to be. I think Zuckerberg's plan was always to dominate the world. You know, he says so himself in his instant messages. I think he always wanted us all to live on Facebook without power over our own data, because he thinks a world where we can share our data completely is a better world. Um, so I think Facebook is actually on uh, going the other way, where people are starting to see it as this bad, dangerous thing, while digital money is just getting started. And do you feel that there's a reason for why we're seeing this interest in Bitcoin and in decentralization broadly? Like, do you think that's part of this backlash that we're seeing against Facebook? Or are they not really related? No, oh, I think they're definitely related. I think we're seeing a revolution going on and, and people really, you know, feeling the, the weight of companies like Facebook, and not just Facebook, let's be fair, Google, all of these major companies are, they feel like, you know, they're taking advantage of, of us in a way that they've created something out of the internet that it wasn't intended to be. I mean, the internet was supposed to be free and open and exchange of ideas without anybody sort of harnessing all of that and siloing it. And, and what Facebook and these major companies did was found a way to make money off of our data um, by controlling it and by capturing it. And I do think there's this trend. Well, you have to admit, Bitcoin started as this libertarian, almost anarchistic thing. It was a form of philosophy in a way. It was a way of being free, um, not having you know anything in between, not you know as secret as it could be. And I think these still feed into it, even as it becomes more regulated and part of the system. So I do think what's going on in money is a response to things like Facebook, um, but also you know overarching government as a whole or the feeling that, you know, more and more we're being controlled by other people. Um, I do think Bitcoin is, is sort of a freeing mechanism. So we're going to discuss the swing in the opposite direction. Uh, and what I mean by that is Facebook's Libra in a moment. But first, a quick word from our fabulous sponsors. Will the world follow France and advocate banning privacy coins? Will government-backed stablecoins become the new fiat? Are distributed and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges just a flash in the pan? The answer is maybe. 
Virtual currencies can flourish and create a new, private, and more versatile economy. But that grand vision can't happen without keeping crypto clean. And that requires support of governments and accountability for bad actors. Privacy-enhanced compliance using cryptographic controls has the potential to preserve anonymity without compromising legitimate investigations. CypherTrace is working on this vision of the future. Sign up to stay up to date on the Privacy-Enhanced Compliance Initiative and receive authoritative crypto AML reports quarterly. www.cyphertrace.com slash keep crypto clean. Hey everyone, don't forget, Unchained is doing a survey. And if you give us your feedback, you can be entered to win some pretty awesome prizes. We want to know, how do you think we can make the show better? How would you like to see Unchained expand? Please take a moment and go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019. That's surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019. It won't take long, I swear. And when we get all your feedback, Unchained will be even better than before. What more could you want than that? Okay, okay, there is something more you could want. You could maybe want to win some of the prizes we're giving out to survey respondents. You could be one of the five lucky people to win a free Casa Bitcoin Lightning Node, plus a free year of Casa's Gold membership, including a multi-sig security app for iPhone and Android, a Trezor hardware wallet, a Casa Faraday bag, and 24-7 support. Those of you interested in learning more about Casa or about protecting your Bitcoin investment generally should check out my interview with CEO Jeremy Welch. Thank you to Casa for donating. Again, the URL is surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019. Go there now to give us your thoughts on the future direction of Unchained and enter the giveaway. Back to my conversation with Ben Mesrick, author of Bitcoin Billionaires. So as you mentioned, initially, you know, Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg maybe had the intention to have a centralized platform that the world would be on. And you talked about how Bitcoin or decentralization might be a response to that. But now Facebook is trying to kind of get on that train as well. What's your take on Facebook's Libra? I mean, how incredibly insane is it that, you know, the Winklevoss twins rise up in Bitcoin and create Gemini and launch a Gemini dollar. And all of a sudden, Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg respond launching Libra. Um, I ended Bitcoin Billionaires on the last chapter with Zuckerberg contemplating a cryptocurrency. And I wrote this, you know, a year ago. And for me, I believe it was all personal. You know, I think Zuckerberg sees the Winklevoss twins rising in this new form of money that Silicon Valley missed entirely. Uh, You know, Facebook, all of these companies are so late in the game in digital. But it makes perfect sense that he would launch one because Facebook's goal you know, is to dominate everything. And I think this is another mechanism for that, an even bigger one. So it it is fascinating that they're launching Libra. I think Libra is both exciting and terrifying. You know, it's exciting in that everyone and their mom is going to suddenly have an electronic wallet. Everyone is going to get comfortable with using digital money with peer-to-peer, but not really peer-to-peer because Libra isn't really that way. Um, But the idea of crypto, this is a big on-ramp. But at the same time, This is still Facebook and not just Facebook. Now, eBay and Uber and all of these people who signed up to be the center of this decentralized thing. Um, So what you're seeing is Facebook finding a way to create a crypto that keeps them in the middle. Um, So it is terrifying. I mean, suddenly Facebook is going to have access to an enormous amount of data and information is going to be taking your money, holding it, earning money on it. Um, but it's also allowing you to get used to electronic currency. So you kind of, I mean, you said that basically you think this is personal, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and so in that light, if Libra is basically going to roll cryptocurrency or, or digital currency out to a, a larger user base than any previous company has so far uh, to a user base that's larger than any country even on earth. Do you Mm -hmm. think that Tyler and Cameron could be sort of eclipsed on their own turf? (laughs) I mean, it's crazy, you know, and people, when I say this is all personal, you know, I, I get pushed back. Obviously, people are like, no, it's just a coincidence. I really don't think this is a coincidence. How does he call it Libra? He's fully aware of the twins in Gemini. He also have to remember that Zuckerberg was was a hacker. You know, he started off as a computer hacker. He launched Facebook after hacking all of the computers at Harvard and making a website 
where you could compare girls and choose who was the hottest girl at Harvard. This is a guy who has a strange sense of humor, who definitely, you know, was the epitome of an internet troll. I mean, he hacked the website of, of Cameron and Tyler and made a web page making fun of Cameron. So I do not put it past him to do this on purpose. And yes, it, it could eclipse Gemini. It could eclipse the twins. On the other hand, they made this huge investment in Bitcoin. You know, they own 1% of all Bitcoin, which they bought between 7 and $10 a coin. So well, they've 1% made, at that time. At that time, right. So they've made billions on this, or at least close to $2 billion at this point. More if you believe that they've bought more on the dips. Um, nobody knows for sure, I don't think, how much they have. Um, but if this bolsters the entire thing, and I think it will, because you have to remember, Libra, it's not a store of value like gold. Libra is tied to fiat, right? So Libra isn't something that you invest in. It's something that you use. While Bitcoin is trending more and more to something you invest in rather than something that you use. So if Libra succeeds, you could foresee Bitcoin succeeding similarly, um, like gold, you know, like rising and rising and rising as more and more people use Libra. So as somebody who has been following the Facebook story, what do you think Mark or Facebook can do or should do with Libra, given what the public perceives is a poor track record around privacy? I mean, that's a great question. And, and uh, I, I would say, listen, Facebook has a lot of problems. And I think one of them is they're built around harvesting data and using it to make money. And that's a horrible look. <laughs> you know, it's very hard to get past that. It makes them all look very bad. Um, they're offering themselves up to regulation. They keep saying, you know, regulate us. We want to be regulated, which is really their way of saying, let us regulate ourselves or let's find a way to look better in front of everybody. I think they need to find a way to, to change their business model. I, I think that Libra has to be perceived as something that is really not giving them data, that they're not taking and using that data for any other reason, that it's merely a mechanism for paying for something um, which they enable, but they take nothing else from it. I, I'm not certain what the ex actual steps are you could take to do that. And you might know better than me. I, I just think that they have a real perception problem because of the way their business is built. You know, you really should be able to use Facebook and not have your data used to target things at you. Mark Zuckerberg likes to say, you know, it enhances our experience. Nobody's experience is enhanced by advertising. Advertising is never enhancing your experience. It's just part of the process to pay for something. So I think that that's not true. So I think they need to find a way to get past that use of data. And Libra is something that shouldn't be used for data gathering. Yeah, well, Facebook is launching or has launched this subsidiary, Calibra, um, which will be the wallet. And supposedly there will be a wall between Calibra and Facebook. But I think the issue still is that Calibra, simply by virtue of being embedded in WhatsApp and Messenger, will just <laughs> amass amounts, right. uh, vast amounts of data, uh, financial data on people. So, um, you know, then then Calibra is the one to worry about. Um, right. So one other thing I wanted to ask about the kind of rivalry that you discussed uh, between Mark and the twins, in my understanding of things, it sort of seems like Mark kind of screwed the twins over. So it, in that regard, like he won, right? So right. then what would motivate him to keep up this, this kind of personal rivalry or, or animus? I mean, Right. Do you know well, what I'm I saying? Like, I could understand if from their side they felt that way, but then I, I don't understand why from his side he would. Well, you go back to the story, and, and you know, this is recounted in Bitcoin Billionaires, but he won in a way. He settled with them for $65 million, which they then took in stock, which ended up being worth hundreds of millions of dollars after the IPO. But they didn't stop there. They really believed that they deserved more and that he had screwed them over. And as these IMs came out later, they attempted to reopen the case multiple times. It was shot down by, by judges who, who had their own issues. Um, and, uh, and so they didn't give up at that point. You know, I framed the whole book like the Count of Monte Cristo, where they disappeared to a cave and come back riding into town with their billions of dollars in Bitcoin. But the reality is they maintain this whole, uh, uh, of animosity, essentially, because they felt that they had been wronged and wronged again, and it hadn't recovered. It was definitely true that when they went out to Silicon Valley after the settlement and tried to become investors, nobody would take their money 
because everyone's end game was to sell to Facebook and everyone knew Zuckerberg harbored this animosity towards them. So his animosity didn't go away. Then you have the movie, right, the social network and all of the resulting publicity, which continued this this personal psychodrama in the public eye for many, many years afterwards. And I don't think Zuckerberg ever really went away from that. You know, he's the kind of guy who is difficult to get along with. You've seen person after person leave the company and then say bad things about it or or, or if they have a non-disclosure, not say anything at all because of the way he treats people who are partners of his. I don't believe that he walks away from this and just forgets about them. Um, so, you know, that's – listen, it's it, someone needs to ask him, and no one does, <laughs> about what he thinks of the Winklevoss twins now, and I'd be curious to hear the answer. Um, but I don't believe he's completely forgotten about them. Hmm. All right. Well, my last question for you is more about your writing and reporting process, because mm-hmm. as I was reading the book, I could not help but notice that there were a lot of details where I just thought – how does Ben know that? <laughs> uh, for instance, there, you know, maybe was a detail where you said like, oh, Charlie's rolling suitcase snagged on the floor as he walked in the airport or these were, right. you know, the person in front of Cameron in the airport security line was wearing Argyle socks or, you know, there were just numerous details like that. So how did you find those details? And also, how did you recreate so much dialogue? Yeah. So I spend the way I do my process is I spend a lot of time with the characters. So the Winklevoss twins with Charlie, you know, spoke to Roger Ver as much as I could to Eric Voorhees. I talk to all of these people. I get all of the court documents that I can. Um, Charlie's arrest scene is a really fascinating scene. And and I built that scene off of talking to him for a very long time. And, and you know, he's read the book and and said that that scene felt absolutely real, like it was yesterday. And so my goal in creating those scenes, essentially recreating those scenes, is to take all of the information I've been given by the people who were there and then paint the picture as much as I can. So details like his suitcase snagging on the ground. Well, he describes to me going through the airport, the arrest process, what's going through his head. um, And the fumbling along in that scene is recreated from that. Um, So I'm painting the picture. Now, I write differently than some journalists do. If I were writing for The New York Times, you wouldn't get that level of detail because, you know, the color of his suitcase would be something that you couldn't definitely know, right? But the way I write narrative nonfiction, and I'm very open about this, is I'm recreating the scene based on the memories of the people who were there and the information that I can gather about that scene. And then I draw the scene. So it is like watching a movie about that scene. It would be very hard to film a movie scene showing Charlie getting arrested in the airport without describing the airport, right? Right. So you look at the airport and you describe it. You can't possibly know uh, what the color of the wall was 10 years ago, but you know there was a color on that wall. And so for me, painting a nonfiction picture is really similar to what a movie does, which is you, you frame the shot. This is what that shot would look like. This is how Charlie remembers that shot. Dialogue is similar. You know, you, you interview the people who were there. They tell you what was spoken about. You don't get the exact words. And then again, if you were writing for the New York Times, you might need the exact words. But if you're painting the picture for a movie or a form of narrative nonfiction, it's not the exact words that matter as much as what was said. Um, so that's a choice I make. And, and you know, I understand that there are going to be journalists out there who don't like that form of nonfiction. Um, but at the same time, I think it's a very valid form of nonfiction and a, and a good way to tell a story to a, to a mass audience. And you keep talking about how you try to frame it like a movie. And as far as I understand, is this also being optioned for a film? This is an already bought film. This is a oh. a, a movie. We haven't announced who or, or where or what yet. Um, Columbia is planning to distribute it. They're the ones who did the social network. Um, but, you know, we're already looking into uh, writing, directing and, and actors. I would love to see Army Hammer come back as the twins. I think he is the perfect <laughs> Winklevoss twins. Um, we've, we've joked around on the internet about who should play Charlie, someone, you know, but, uh, but there's lots of, lots of great possibilities, but yeah, this will definitely be a movie. Um, and, uh, soon we will, we will announce details about that. Great. Wait, well, that's something that we can all look forward to. Um, thanks for coming on Unconfirmed. No, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I've learned an awful lot about the crypto world and I'm still, learning. Um, but, you know, people like you uh, who have done this for a while, I'm, I'm learning so much from. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Anytime. 
Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about the topics we discussed, be sure to check out the links in the show notes of your podcast player. If you haven't yet taken the Unchained survey or entered to win a free CASA node, do so now at surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchanged survey 2019. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Fractal Recording, Anthony Yoon, Daniel Nuss, and Rich Straffolino. Thanks for listening.